to the Take the North podcast. I'm David Hoff on the Mullen Haas Show on 670 The Score. Dan Weeders from the Chicago Tribune covering the Chicago Bears. And we are talking draft as we are now two weeks away. The Bears are on the clock. We know who they're going to take first, no matter what you may read elsewhere. And we're going to talk about what they might do at nine and with the other two picks that they currently have. But, Dan, there are no shortage of of storylines as we get ready for the draft and the bears on the clock, even though we know exactly what's going to happen first. Yeah. I was looking at my itinerary. I fly to Detroit uh, in less than two weeks. I'll be uh, a couple days spent there. It'll be interesting uh, the day before the draft to get in front of some of those prospects. Uh, they, they always uh, are out in front of a, a charity event. You would imagine that Caleb Williams would be there, and then we'll kind of work our way around to all the possible guys that could be the number nine pick for the Chicago Bears, which, as you and I have documented for weeks now, is a menu of really, really impressive players that, that Ryan Poles is going to have an opportunity to choose off of. Yeah, that's one way I, w- I want to start here, because I think, obviously, we want to uh, update people on what's going on with visits and what we know about you know Caleb Williams' busy week because he keeps on responding to people. But <laughs> I think that... Um, One of the benefits of having a podcast like this is sometimes you can get into specific questions or areas that you might not ordinarily get to in the context of a of of a 800 word story or uh, a 15 minute segment on the radio. I really wonder if through all of this examination of what the Bears are going to do in this draft and we thought about this this morning again, is if we are looking at this, this, this position, this depth chart with the Bears, as you go through it and with the number nine pick, we always say, well, they don't really have a specific need. They don't have a glaring need. They need an edge rusher, then a wide receiver, offensive tackle. Are we assuming a lot more about Braxton Jones as a left tackle than maybe he has – maybe that's more credit than he has earned? And I want to be fair to the player because he's been pretty serviceable for his first two years. Definitely a surprise based on his draft status. But I wonder – here, the Bears are drafting a franchise quarterback with Caleb Williams. Yeah. We talk about the need for a receiver. That left tackle spot, you could solidify just as well in many, possibly, whether it's Alt or Fashionu or R.C. Latham was in town this week from JC, Alabama. JC I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, J.C., not R.C. <laughs> um, J.C. Latham. Are we giving Braxton Jones – too much credit for being a guy that has answered a question that still may nag them if he's if he's still the left tackle. RC is the cola that you can only find in the Hallis Hall media room or the press box at Soldier I knew, Field. I knew I this <laughs> in my head for some reason. So it, yeah, it was connected to the Bears podcast. Um, it's an interesting question because I think when 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 you're going through stages of uh, rebuilding and kind of getting yourself back in position to contend again you have to stop settling for solid and serviceable and start reaching for star potential, which I think is part of what, what you're asking here is if the bears can make an upgrade at a premium position, would they be reticent to do it because they feel comfortable with what Braxton Jones has given them in his first two years in the leagues. Braxton Jones did spend a chunk of the, the start of last season on injured reserve with a neck injury. That's something that only the people inside that building will know in terms of their worry and their concern level on what that can mean long term and then i'm going to throw something else at you because there is this 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 tackle class that's really really intriguing as you mentioned um but then there's a bunch of guys that that are probably better fit at right tackle and so one of the things that i think is going to be really worth exploring in the months after the draft is how willing and it may depend on who they pick but the bears would be to to consider darnell Wright as a starter at left tackle to potentially move him to the left side and take another rookie tackle that you could plug in on the right side. Remember, Darnell Wright played left tackle uh, his second to last year at Tennessee. He has experience there. He has comfort there. And I think he has the trust of the people in the organization that he could at least be tried over there if they wanted to go that route. And so I think what that does at a minimum is it, it, it opens you up to exploring any of these tackle prospects and saying, hey, does one of these guys fit our big picture vision for uh propelling this offense to the next level and to your your main point here protecting your quarterback in a way that brings out the best in him well before i answer that but has there been any discussion about that that you're aware of internally or even let's theoretically to moving him and and would he be would he be open to that would he be good at that do you think yes 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 would be my answers to that okay the 
Because <laughs> we had some conversation about that last year after they drafted him, right? I remember before they well, drafted and, him. And he, he, here's when, when it came up, but it came up in a week that was defined by many other things. On the day that Justin Fields called out coaching in his press conference, on the day that Alan Williams resigned as defensive coordinator, <laughs> that was also the day that Braxton Jones went on injured reserve. And at that right. time, question on, okay, at this point, would they be open to the possibility of moving Darnell right there for the duration of, of Braxton Jones being an IR, they decided not to do it. I talked to Darnell right in the locker room on that day in question. Uh, and he said, look, I'm comfortable doing it. I did it in college, whatever they'd want for me. I think I could do it at, at a, a high level. And I think there is some intrigue in the building uh, at the possibility of that being there for them. Look, they love flexibility. You'll always hear coaches, um, talk about the, the value of, of position flexibility and Darnell Wright gives them that. And, and each bit of flexibility you have, it opens the door for you to make decisions uh, in ways that fit your team best. And so, you know, look like it may, maybe it is just grasping, but I wouldn't be surprised if Braxton Jones spends a little bit of time in the spring taking, I'm sorry, uh, Darnell Wright spends a little bit of time in the spring taking some reps at left tackle just so they can feel that out more. And then again, some of that may hinge on what happens in the draft two weeks from now. Well, I just think that it, it bears asking because I, the way it came up was we, you know, on the morning show, and Molly and I really like the idea, like a lot of people, I think the, the percentages of mock drafts that favor the Bears picking Roma Dunze at number nine is higher than any other player, uh, potentially because of the way things could fall. And I love that idea. And I think that they would be getting somebody to grow with Caleb Williams. And so maybe we're overthinking this. But I also started thinking, well, you know, if you're looking at this team in terms of weaknesses or things that they, you know, you don't want to draft for need, but you can still, you kind of always are, are leaning that way. You look at the wide receivers; they, they have, they have, uh, as we have established, two of the maybe the top five tan, one of the top five tandems in the NFL yeah. with Keenan Allen and DJ Moore. Yeah, you're, 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 you're adding to that mix, and frankly, you don't have that same dynamic on your on your offensive line, and your offensive line really could use work, and there's. There's no, there'd be nothing wrong with them going after an offensive tackle in a class that's deep with them, whether you move Darnell right to the left side, whether you keep him on the right side and 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 plug in a rookie next to Tevin Jenkins. I, I, I just wonder, I just wonder if it's the right guy and if they if they go that route, is 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 it because they don't have as much confidence in Braxton Jones as sometimes people uh, outside the building might. I mean, I think if they went that route, it would be because they saw an avenue to becoming a championship football team quicker, you know, and that, that that's what this is all about ultimately. And it's one of the things that um, is always the compass for Ryan Poles in the decisions he makes. And, and he has been pretty fearless uh, about making decisions like that when they register on his radar as being the right ones. And so um, – Look, like, again, we've we've said this now for, for a handful of weeks that, that whatever they do at nine is going to make sense. And there aren't a lot of mock drafts out there where, where they present a possibility where you go, that's just ludicrous. There are some. We'll get into that in a, a few minutes. But, like, th they've, got, they've got just a, a really, really intriguing path of options here to go down. And, and, and so um, that certainly is one of them, in my opinion. I don't, I don't think that, that Braxton Jones, as well as he has played, for his first two seasons of his NFL career has, has made you go irreplaceable, you know, absolutely can't bump him to the side for an upgrade there, particularly when you're talking about trying to nurture a rookie quarterback and bring his development along in, in the proper way. Yeah. I, I just think it's something to keep an eye on. I, I don't want to overthink. I do like the idea too of, uh, you know, obviously if, uh, whether it's all, and also I'm starting to look deeper at, uh, at fashion new, <laughs> you, you have, all kinds of time, and I think maybe we are overthinking it because of the prospects of the wide receiver are, are what they are. Um, so that got into a broader discussion, I mean, in terms of the depth of the roster and how um, it's been put together and how it compares to others in the division. And I think that we all uh, assume that the Lions are going to be the team to beat in the NFC North. The Packers would be next with Jordan Love returning from a really strong uh, first year as a starter. And then the Bears and the Vikings. And however, you know, they, I think the Bears have climbed out of the basement, how much they've closed the gap. We'll see. But I think I wondered if the Lions uh, have become somewhat vulnerable because I, I uh, saw the story with Jared Goff talking about the local media being too negative, And it sounded <laughs> kind of whiny to me. But it did raise a bigger question. You know, as I said on the air on, on Thursday morning, 
teams always talk about how they handle adversity. I think rarely do we talk about how they handle success, but I think it's an issue. And teams like Detroit, I wonder, I wonder how the Lions will handle the success and how that might affect the NFC North race. It's new, right? It's new for them in Detroit. I, th- I think you phrased it well on the radio on Thursday morning and saying that the Bears have, have long uh, held up a banner at 1920 <laughs> football drive talking about how well they lose. You know, they do it with grace. They do it with class. They do it without dysfunction. <laughs> and eventually you want to change that into how well do you win and, and what what's in your trophy case. And, and so the Lions – we're a team that, that drew a lot of scrutiny going into last year. People were not really ready to buy into the hype until they backed it up. Uh, and they backed it up. You know, they won the division. They were within a half of playing for the Super Bowl. Uh, they had everything going right with a, a core group of playmakers, a core group of leaders, and a head coach and a general manager that the entire organization seems to believe in. And so that momentum is real. Now, I think your question is very well phrased because we've lived it here. We lived 2019 in Chicago. The Bears were the team in 2018 that won 12 games. They were the team that were not for the double doink people thought could have played much later into January, if not reached the final game in February. And the next year they went into the season with Super Bowl expectations. And we all know how that season went. It it, it finished at eight and eight. It finished with a lot of questions about the quarterback and the coach. It finished with a lot of uh, worry about whether the bears were going to be able to get themselves off the mat. They didn't necessarily handle success very well. When you have success, and this was talked about during the early run of, of Seattle uh, with Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson and the Legion of boom and all those guys that, that like eventually team goals give way to individual pursuits sometimes. And that, that can create, um, little dynamics that that kind of wear away at a football team's ability to to stay down that path of success without hitting potholes it's a great question to ask dave burkett who's been a a friend of this podcast has appeared on our show before was talking to me at the owners meetings in florida a couple weeks ago about how just weird it was for him to be sitting in the seat you know that this time of year the 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 reporters in detroit have always been used to examining the top 10 of the draft, figuring out who the Lions were going to take with the number five overall pick, figuring out how they were going to get the the, the, the new coach right. And he, he was like, look, it looks like we're set at general manager, at coach, at quarterback with the core of the team. And I said, be careful, because right. in the 2019 owners meetings, I stood on a lawn in, in, <laughs> in Arizona with the executive of the year, Ryan Pace, the coach of the year, Matt Nagy, a Pro Bowl quarterback and Mitch Trubisky on the roster and thought, man, the window is open for the Bears to dominate the division for four to five years, and they haven't won the division since. And so it's a very valid question. It's a it's a good comparison, too, because I think with teams like and organizations like the 49ers or the Chiefs or the Patriots or the Steelers, you don't necessarily worry about that. Nobody's wondering how John Harbaugh is going to handle success in Baltimore and whether or not they can duplicate it based on how they handle the offseason. I don't think you hear a lot of complaints out of Baltimore about certain things that come with winning programs. It's just something to keep an eye on. Well, look, and like everybody is ready to rub your belly and tell you how good you are when you're the upstart underdog that's just breaking onto the screen, onto the scene. And that's fun. Like the, the Lions enjoyed that last year. They rode that wave and they surfed it really, really well. It's a different matter, as you mentioned, with the Jared Goff stuff, when, when people start looking for holes and they start you know, nitpicking or criticizing or finding things uh, to, to, to focus on uh, that you might not want them focused on. And so it's, it's just a new experience and they're going to have to figure out how to, how to handle it. The Packers, you worry less about that, I think, because of, uh, I I just, maybe it all stems from as much as I like and find Dan Campbell, a fascinating character. I don't know yet if I trust his ability to do what we just described and that's to take success in stride because they were so, so fueled by the disrespect or finding an edge or people doesn't believe and all the things that won't be true next year. So I wonder how do you do that again? And with LaFleur and the Packers, I don't really have the same concerns because I think they have been so successful. He took over uh, as a head coach of a, of a team and a franchise that was used to winning and he continued it largely. So there's just different little things that you look at as, as you kind of examine where the bears are and how much they have closed the gap. Talent wise, the bears are going to wake up the Monday after the draft, after signing all their undrafted free agents and, and adding their four draft picks as of now, maybe more to the mix. I think on, on the Monday after the draft, we're going to look at this roster. I think you like to do that, kind of evaluate it at that point and see the Bears have maybe improved their talent level, maybe as much as they're going to be in the top five of teams that have had you know productive off-seasons, 
franchise changing, season changing, off seasons. Uh, and I, I'm not sure they, they could be closer to one than five. It's going to be, I think, maybe top five, maybe top three of teams that have improved themselves. And look, it's fun, right? Like it's fun to come from the depths that they were at just, you know, 18 months ago and, and find yourself looking at a team that that looks like it's ready to go to the starting gate of 2024 and be competitive and, and potentially um, find ways to, to to win. And so, um, hey, look, like I, I, it's going to be really interesting to see how they handle this draft. We've talked about this several times in recent weeks. They only have four picks now. Um, Ryan Poles doesn't seem as worried as most in the outside world do about the volume of draft capital he has to use in two weeks. Will they add a pick or two? Maybe. Um, if not, if they have a four or five man draft class and that is what it is. And then they're just going to have to figure out how to navigate it from there. Um, most people in the league believe that the picks that the bears do have are positioned. Well, look like this draft is loaded at the top. You've got two in the top 10 that that's really, really good. And it falls off dramatically after round four, the bears have no picks currently after round four. And so, uh, you can pull your hair out a little bit about the, the, the lack of picks that they do have, but Given the way this draft sets up, it feels like a lot of things have set up really nicely for this football team. All right, I have two more things I want to get to in no particular order, unless you have some grievances you would like to air. But, uh, <laughs> Surprisingly, today is a day I'm very low on grievances to air, so go good. after it. That's, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you're relaxed and tanned and rested and all those things. I'm grumpy. I got three hours sleep. Uh, so regarding these this mock draft idea which i think is fun it's an industry we have a great time evaluating it heck in in the draft the pre-draft process there's so many good people out there that do terrific jobs and their live their livelihoods are defined by this and look I, and i think of dane brugler came out with the beast from the athletic <laughs> dane does a tremendous job and he you can hear it in his voice we talk to a lot of guys who whose whose lives are revolve around scouting and evaluating and mock drafting. And then there's the Bleacher Report mock draft. And I'm sure there are hardworking people that put their time and energy into this. But when I see something as egregiously dumb as what I saw this morning, I think you have to kind of, it's our job to have an opinion. And my opinion is that they're trying too hard to be noticed. They're trying too hard to get clicks. The Bleacher Report uh, unless it's a reputable outlet, we have guests on our show that have are all over the place. They have a mock draft that has the Bears selecting Drake May as the quarterback. That would shock the world and get somebody fired. This is not going to happen. And I know they say that their scouting uh, evaluation and it's what the scouts would do. And, and maybe if that would reframe that way, but when you see mock draft, you think this is what this entity thinks this team is going to do in this spot. If anybody thinks the Bears aren't going to take Caleb Williams with the number one overall pick, they're not paying attention and they're not to be trusted because they're not paying attention. This is vetted. I have a difficult this time. I, I'm just saying I, I could go on forever, but like I see that and it's just easy to dismiss. I, I just have a difficult time understanding what scouts would advocate for that and why I, I just like, like I, I, it, it, none of it makes sense. And it, and it certainly doesn't marry up with reality in terms of what's happening. And so um, look like we get stuff like this every year where it feels like a look at me, attention, seeking device to get attention and maybe that's what this is i just i i, I mean like i think you're justified in in doing the what you're doing man <laughs> and this particular topic because what you're doing man bleach your report like I, I i don't know what you're trying to prove with this pick i don't either and i thought about you know what you trying doing, to reach man? out there thank you thanks does <laughs> what you doing man i thought about you know trying to have a conversation about this with somebody who was involved in that. And then I thought that's basically giving them the attention. They probably seek for something like this. Look, we, we both are in an industry, you know, we're sports writers or, you know, I'm close enough to still be considered a sports writer. <laughs> you know, we, there are a lot of notice me guys in the industry. And I, I, I th felt like it's one of those things you write just to, for someone to say, like, I guess I'm giving them the attention. And it's like, are you kidding me? Really? 
Let's all have a conversation here. Who expects them to check Drake May? If they want to say Jaden Daniels, like um, Dan Orlowski for a while was still on that kick, and he's a highly respected. I respect his opinion. He played in the league and all these things. He's come off of that, hasn't he? He may think that Jaden Daniels is going to be a better NFL quarterback, and maybe Drake May, some people think that's a different conversation. If you're telling me mock draft, it's like, who do you think this team is going to take? They're not taking Drake May. They're done with this. North Carolina quarterback thing. No way. The other thing I hate about this entire process is the inconsistency in it. You know, like uh, guys like Orlovsky and Chase Daniel, they change their uh, uh, opinions every couple weeks just to match what the current like wind direction is. And it's like, you know, a few months ago, it was like Chase Daniel was telling you that there was zero chance that the Bears could even consider getting rid of Justin Fields. And now it's like Caleb Williams is the capital letters, <laughs> best quarterback I've ever seen uh, scouted on film at any <laughs> level of any of any game. And you got to take him if he's there. But it, they probably should have stuck with Fields. And you're like, well, what are we doing? Like, what yeah, are we doing? I, so, what are we hey, doing? Thanks for getting that off your chest. Uh, okay. So I'm, just, that's, I'm still in good spirits, though. So thankfully, you that's good. Back. I didn't ruin your day. <laughs> Here, here's the other thing that's not even like a grievance. It's just uh, one of these things that I think is kind of silly or funny and inconsequential. Why did Jalen Johnson change from 33 to his college number one? <laughs> why would a quarter? Why would a cornerback do anything to make him more? distinct or noticeable or make the bullseye on his back any bigger it's a dumb thing i know but it's something like if i were jalen johnson established as number 33 i would want to keep it there even though number one may look cooler eddie jackson got a big contract and changed his jersey number from 39 to four and then fell off immediately how did that work out okay <laughs> my point exactly right. look like i don't i don't know if the jersey number matters um, I don't know. I mean, it's certainly going to be the next question we ask Jalen Johnson when we see him again, uh, whether it's at the Piccolo Awards or, or up the road at, at OTAs. Um, it's not just changing your number. It's changing your number to, to the one last worn by the guy that everyone was defending in the building. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you, you, you're leaving your, your uniform behind? All right, I'll take the jersey. Take care. Good luck in Pittsburgh. <laughs> the body's still warm. <laughs> I mean, I, I just – I know he wore that at Utah. It may have special meaning to him. But things are going pretty well for Jalen Johnson wearing 33. I, I We hear all the time about these guys with all their superstitions and – you know, Danny Hurley has his different kind of color of M&Ms before he coaches the national championship game. But I just am surprised that he would change at this stage of his career when things are going so well. I Little wish thing. I uh, I need to get some M&Ms for my pregame routine. I need to uh, add that in. Those are good. Yeah, that's a good. I, I Although I, Danny Hurley wears the same underwear like six <laughs> weeks in a row, too. I don't think I would recommend that. I don't know. His superstitions. We know way too much about Danny Hurley. Yeah, though, I didn't. I didn't know that one until just now. So thanks for uh, putting yeah, that up. It's, it's, speed. It, you know, we, you know, got to listen, get up early and we'll listen to the morning show, get those kind of details. All right. So let's see. I checked off my Bleacher Report rant. Um, now I've got my number one jersey. Anything else that we have to uh, address before we move on to um, our next podcast? Well, look, like, I, you know, I, the other thing that uh, on the topic of the Lions is like they're going to have to get used to the first place schedule as well, right? That's new territory as well. The Bears will will still be playing the last place schedule. So when we're looking at rosters, we're also looking at a schedule that for three games out of the 17 will give you an opportunity to play teams that that finished at the bottom of their division uh, in 2023. I know that's the Patriots for the Bears. It's the Commanders, and there's one other on that list that that you know they get instead of the <laughs> you know the the Bills and the and the Eagles, right? So. Um, that's part of this, right? Is you do get that advantage as a last place team and a disadvantage as a first place team. And that that's going to be part of the landscape for the lions going forward uh, as well. And, and look like I, this is a, an opportunity now here for the bears to, to really start to make up ground uh, that they've had trouble closing for a long time. And, and I think we're uh, nearing the, the point where we can start looking at that through a, a pretty realistic lens. So is there anything new on George McCaskey and the Bears and Hard Knocks? Did I see that uh, somewhere that he uh, – is that still a possibility? I know he still doesn't want to do it, and I know that they want to control the message. As we see, uh, their latest production of 1920 Football Drive. Yeah, I don't think that they, they, they're they raising their hand to do it. That's for sure. Um, certainly listening to George and Ryan Poles talk about it, they didn't have any interest in kind of – kind of bringing that on, but uh, they've got, yeah, again, they've got ways of, of taking you behind the curtain and doing it their way. Um, I imagine they'll do that. I haven't watched the latest episode of 1920 football drive. Have you gotten to it yet? 
I got to some of it this morning. I started it, and it's it's pretty good behind the scenes stuff. It has Ryan Poles talking about wanting a playmaker and wanting to make a difference in an offense and make you think that hmm, what are they? Why are they releasing this before the draft? Two weeks? Are they smoke screen because they want the offensive? T- oh, who knows? Who knows? It, it's pretty. It's pretty well done though. I, I do applaud the Bears. You know. Their, their messaging can be clumsy, and we know there's a lot going on in that building, but they're doing the 1920 football drive. That part of it is very well done. That was going to be my last note, is that there is a lot of things going on inside that building right now. It seems like with each passing day we get um, the introduction or announcement of somebody that has been hired to an executive role inside the building. There's been a few more this week, uh, a lot of newly created positions. It's part of the new sort of leadership style and direction of, of Kevin Warren at the owners meetings a few weeks ago, George McCaskey was asked kind of how he's acclimated to Kevin's style. And he just, you know, he referred to Kevin as a force of nature and said that, that when they made that hire, they made it with the understanding that they were going to have to quickly get comfortable to a new way of doing things. Well, Kevin is quickly showing them a new way of doing things. I don't know what all of it means. You know, again, a lot of these positions, newly created executive positions and they're moving bodies around, uh, not sure what kind of dividends those will pay, but I do think you can't simultaneously ask the Bears to do things in a new way because they've been stuck in mediocrity for 40 plus years and then criticize the attempt to do things in a new way. We'll just have to see kind of how this all uh, plays out in which direction it leads them in. But certainly there are there are significant and new changes being made on a regular basis uh, in Lake Forest. I think that's a really good thing to remember, and I'll close on that. There are a lot of new faces. There are There is a new approach. And why is there an attention to all these new changes and a new approach? Is because the old way wasn't working. We always have been critical of the Bears in terms of messaging, in terms of, oh, that is so, so Bears, right? That's yeah. so way of doing things. If they're trying a new way, there's a reason why. And the reason the reasons why have been studied and scrutinized by people like us over the last two decades at least. And as long as you've been here, as long as I have been here. So this is maybe a new way of doing things. We'll see. The last thing is quickly, the Arlington Heights tax bill has been appealed. We'll see where that goes. That's the latest on that. They still have an infatuation with the lakefront, according to the headline in our Chicago Tribune, your Chicago Tribune. And we'll see where that one goes. But that is an ongoing saga negotiation, however you want to describe it. So those last two topics, advanced tease from me, Chicago Tribune, uh, working on multiple stories. One about the Bears' grand vision for a a lakefront stadium and the uh, expectation that they will present some at least ideas and plans for it here before the month's up. And then Colleen Kane working on a, on a longer piece on, on Kevin Warren's vision and the changes he is making. And so within the next week to 10 days, you should have two, uh, two pieces that go a little bit deeper on both of those topics. Looking forward to that. And thank you for listening to the take the North podcast. You can get us on the free odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast. You can watch us on six, seven scores, YouTube page for Adam Sadzinski and Dan Weeder. I'm David Haw. Thanks for listening to the Take the North podcast. Great talk. See you out there.